So, just to introduce Duncan. Duncan has a chair at Cambridge in the manufacturing um, in IFM, yep. Institute for Manufacturing. Um, and Duncan's done a lot of stuff in the space. And I, I said to him, what we really want to hear is your views. Okay, so yeah, I, I just want to provide a, 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 a perspective on, I guess, my, my view on Internet of Things. And uh, in, in, in many different ways, I've been involved in around these sort of ideas for about 10 or 12 years through the Distributed Information Automation Lab uh, in Cambridge, uh, through our work with MIT and other universities in what's called the Auto ID Lab, that first uh, started to use in, uh, introduce RFID across supply chains, and through a, a spin out company, Redline, which you'll hear more from Alex Wong uh, a bit later on this afternoon. Uh, so I've got, got, a lot, got lots of different angles to bring on it, and I think they're all nicely summed up um, in the next slide. Uh, which this, this is a, a diagram we were using in the, in the Auto ID Centre about uh, 12, 13 years ago. And, and actually, the Auto ID Centre is, is often attributed to where the phrase Internet of Things came from. And uh, I, depending on if, which, side, which side of the Atlantic you were, you'd either have a bowl of pasta in, in, in the States or a, a tin of soup, jar of soup in the UK. And the idea was, what would it take to get that, that jar of soup to talk to a microwave oven in order to get itself uh, made, get warmed up, heated, etc. And and we, you know, we, we were talking about that ideas. You know, we were talking about the ideas versus real plans. And we lived on that sort of idea for about a year and a half, I reckon, before someone said, "You guys have to do that. Actually, have to do something." And so, you know, the the challenge is, how, you know, how do you get soup to talk to a microwave oven? Well, firstly, the you know, jar of soup is pretty dumb to begin with. So we had to put stuff onto a, a can of soup. We had to then connect it to information about it. Uh, you, had to, you, had to connect, you then had to find a way for the two to talk to each other. And finally, you had to get into the microwave and hack into its control to allow it to turn itself on. Oh, and the big, actually, big job, which we never really mastered, is you've got to have a person here that picks the soup up and pours it in the microwave. And ideally, takes the metal lid off as well. But, uh, uh, so yeah, that was where, where we, we, we got into the Internet of Things. Um, so really, you know, Originally, it was a vision. It was just kind of an idea on how to get stuff talking to other stuff. And uh, actually, at the time, uh, Andy Hopper and others in the computer lab came, which were doing lots of getting people onto networks. And so, you know, when we talked to Andy about this, he said, "Okay, yeah, great. You guys can do some things stuff." Um, and and when we when we were doing it, what we did, just just as I mentioned a moment ago. We, we were we working with RFID systems, so we we were you know we had no real notion of what infrastructure was required to do it. So we just invented everything. So we you know grabbed hold of RFID tags, said actually get a tag can of soup. You need a very cheap um, bit of bit of te uh, electronics here. So everything else you need to access through a network, and that network might be a mechanism for getting hold of data associated with the the the, the, the can of soft drink or a bottle of jar of soup. But also, we, we also were, had this notion that you'd have a decision-making agent somewhere out there that would actually talk, talk, be able to talk to other, uh, other devices and get it, get it operating. So that was the vision. And actually, you know, I guess the message I'm going to get through here is lots of applications that are IoT-type applications have existed for a while, but the real struggle there was there was no infrastructure to do it. We had to sort of invent it, and, and, and uh, a lot of hacking and a lot of mistakes, actually. Uh, so what, my sense of what, we, what we've got, though, is, is really, you know, what we were doing back then was saying, well, you know, we've got computers on the internet. H how do we extend that to, you know, at the time, actually, phones and stuff weren't even on the internet. Uh, and certainly, you know, everyday, everyday objects weren't. But in, in a way, IoT, to me, isn't a great revolution. It's just a, it's a natural extension. So that's the first thing. Uh, I think Uday's uh, seven layers, I was quick, trying to desperately write those all down before, but, you know, to me, IoT is that is is that enabling layer or enabling infrastructure that makes all the stuff we were trying to do ten years ago and since a lot more easy. Um, this I'm also I'm a, originally I was a feedback control engineer, uh, and uh, because I do that, I, I, I like to always have one feedback loop in every talk, I give. and I, I've been managing that for about fifteen years so far. But it's, it's really important in this, in this environment because actually a lot of the dialogue is about things, sensing things about things, and maybe using that to change what we do. But for me, the key is how do you close the loop? Because 
sensing is, is actually valueless on its own. So sensing is only useful if you can uh, measure something or sense something that actually enables you to do something better than you were doing before. It's really obvious, but in some ways, you know, I, I, that that some is often missed. And and, and you know, the, there's there's a lot of work on getting stuff up off an object onto a network. But what we really want to be able to do is to get stuff back down, <laughs> either to the object or something like the microwave, something that's going to act on the object. Uh, and so, you know, for me, it's all about actions and decisions involving everyday objects. Uh, and. I, there's probably, you know, we, uh, Bide mentioned there could be lots of arguments today. Uh, well, you know, here, this is a start. I don't, I don't think IoT is a technology. I don't think it's an application. I just think it's an enabling platform. Uh, so that's my perspective. And uh, I'll, I'll try to leave early so you can not beat me up too much about that. Okay, so um, why, 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 why do Internet of Things type, type applications? In fact, why, why do Internet of Things? Well. If you, there's lots of stuff around that says for all that I, in fact, when we started the, the Auto ID Centre work uh, you know, 12, 13 years ago, we, I was talking to people in Walmart, or Procter and Gamble, or Gillette, and they're saying, yeah, I really want to improve the visibility of my supply chain. And I said, well, that's great, what do you mean by that? And actually, the first thing was, no one really knew what they meant by visibility of their supply chain. They had this magical notion they wanted to know where everything was at any given time. But actually what they also didn't know is what the value was. It seemed a great idea to be able to turn on a computer screen and say, whoa, you know, my latest order is sitting there right now. But actually, unless you're going to make a decision based on that, it's no use. But, you know, but in, in essence, there is value in visibility. Uh, you can use it to achieve some of these things as well. So greater efficiency, be better control of the business in some ways. So I think, you know, they're, they're the obvious plays. And, you know, in a way, they're, they're the linear issues associated with perhaps having a better platform of internet of, uh, around Internet of Things, but to me, actually, it, it's more about this right-hand side, uh, it, it, even though that right-hand side then feed, feeds back over here. So, you know, I, I, was, I, you know, I was looking on, on one of the websites linked to this uh, uh, event today, and there was a guy saying, you know, the great thing about Internet of Things is suddenly you can connect all those objects around you in the car onto a network, and all sorts of opportunities uh, arise. And uh, Actually, that, I thought, well, that's really good. But actually, anything I want to do is be able to find my car key uh, on a regular basis. So, you know, I think actually, where's my stuff is kind of a good starting point. But more generally, it's it's these two things. Uh, you know, uh, when I was working in manufacturing, well, I still am working in manufacturing control systems. When I started doing that about 20 years ago, we were just at the beginning of the whole notion of can I customise products in manufacturing? What you know, do I need to keep making the same stuff? For it day, um, continuously on a production line, or can I actually interfere with the, the production operations and accurately manage individual items, whether it's a car or a vacuum cleaner, in order that the, the item that comes out is actually tailored towards some special market requirement. The other, the other angle from our point of view, which is really interesting, uh, and we like to think we've invented a word there, but it's almost unpronounceable, but customization. And that, 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 the, the thing I mean by that is, you know, it, there's this great leap of faith if you're, if you're a, uh, let's say, a retailer, you, you, you place an order on your, one of your regular manufacturers to produce, I don't know, a huge amount of uh, uh, pasta sauce, let's say, and, and it might be a, to a slightly new recipe. You hand that over, and then the great leap of faith is you do nothing about it until it turns up on your doorstep. But actually, what, what, what is it, you know, that, that's amazing, because basically you're saying, you go ahead as a, as a manufacturer or a producer, and, my, and do, do my stuff whenever it suits you to do, as long as it turns up on time. So what happens inside that organisation is things go wrong, get delays, and suddenly you find out your order's been delayed. And maybe that order's really important to you to have on time, yet you've lost control of it. So companies like Toyota, for example, invented Kanban systems so that they could actually pervade back into their supply chain. Well, what we see um, in, in there are things, and some of the applications sitting on it that being able to do is actually help the consumer to be more pervasive within their provider's environment. And that doesn't have to be an industrial environment, it could be a societal environment. Maybe you want to understand where, like my personal experience recently, where, where is the planning department going at, up to with your planning application? Uh, doesn't really need any of things to do, it's just something that upset me recently. Um, okay, so 
just to give you a sense of um, this, this is not uh, this is this is kind of why we're doing why we've been doing Internet of Things style stuff. So going back to uh, twelve years ago, when Alex and I wrote wrote a paper on what we call the consumer driven supply chain, uh, what we thought we we thought the Internet of Things would be really good at doing is helping you do a couple of things. Firstly giving you as a consumer options on where your stuff could be made or where it can be distributed or who distributed it uh, or perhaps as a retailer having those options. But secondly, what we saw is at the time we were looking at the, 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 the chasm in the consumer goods supply chain where you have a lot of information about products up to the point of retail then it just completely drops off the face of the earth. So if you, you have a broken down toaster what, do you, what happens when you take it back to the shop? They just ditch it, chuck it away, give you another one if you're lucky. But actually, there might be some really simple thing wrong with it in which can be picked up through the usage data. There is no connection between that, that toaster and, and, and the information system that, that's linked to it. In fact, perhaps the toaster was, ma uh, was made in a faulty batch, so actually the manufacturer ought to be able to resolve that. So that was where we started. We've done some work on logistics around consumer-driven logistics linked to that. Uh, in our lab, we built a system for Gillette, which enabled you to actually customise Gillette gift boxes for Christmas. Uh, and and, and if it, essentially, you owned the, you drove your your order drove the whole manufacturing operation. And if you changed it, the whole manufacturing operation would reverse itself. Uh, nice video on our website if you want to dig into that. Work we did with Fiat about six years ago involved putting tag components under the hood of a, a, a Fiat and, and using that to drive the car, when we drove the car into a service centre, all the components would actually talk to the net, Fiat's network and determine not just the state of the car but the state of each individual component. So a clutch pad, uh, a, clu a clutch may well have been re refurbished three times, so it's actually been due to be re, um, uh, just thrown away or it might have been refurbished once but used in a different car and actually have more life left to it. So actually getting all those components to talk to, to FIAT's operations and therefore, and then come back to the service system was a critical thing. We just finished a project with Boeing uh, where, well, this, this is an example of a talking life jacket, not, 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 not maybe the most important item, but it all, sort of, certainly it is in the, to a sense, an extent. But the, what we were doing with them was an, a, enabling all the components on their aircraft, the major components, to be able to talk directly to the supply organisations that either provided repair, servicing, inspection, or replacement tasks. And then finally, within Redbike, we're doing work where we've got uh, either goods or tools in warehouses in manufacturing operations that are actually managing their own stock check and replacement process. So that's kind of why. It's not why do IoT. This is, this is the sort of uh, useful industrial applications that could really have done at the time with a platform that allows you to do the, to develop rather than having to hack it into the existing IT infrastructure. And you know, the thing that makes Redbyte's life absolutely the hardest is trying to interface to SAP. Because SAP isn't geared up, it's, not a, it's certainly not at the moment an Internet of Things product, uh, to say the least. Uh, so, okay, just some really fast notes on developing Internet of Things, uh, how to do it. Uh, I think this common platform is, is really critical and you know, we've had experience in developing parts of the common platform, it's, it's really tough to do. Uh, standards, I think people will probably talk about standards, but unless, you know, the, the Internet of Things is only going to work across a lot of organisations. Uh, thirdly, covering the whole closed loop. So, you know, if, if you want, you can email me and I can send you a white paper on Internet of Things building blocks, but this is our our, kind of our template for Internet of Things development. And, and the key thing is, you see, data collection is important. Uh, data representation, data management, data storage, location and retrieval of data in an appropriate manner. But then this key thing here, execution and control, is a key element of an Internet of Things architecture if you're going to actually complete the process. So, uh, into my last... Uh, Probably, I've probably passed my last minute, to be honest. Uh, final comment about uh, addressing barriers to deployment. Uh, and, you know, we tend to talk about barriers at at least four different levels. Uh, so a lot of work going on on technical feasibility of, these, uh, of doing this. So I actually, I suspect that's not very hard, to be really honest. Uh, and it's really these three things that are going to be the barriers. 
you know, can we actually show there are benefits from taking an IoT approach that you can quantify uh, compared to using existing IT infrastructure? Given that the end of things is not is not an application, it's enabling, potentially enabling new applications, as Udo said, some of them are hard to, to quantify benefits for as well. Uh, again, then, is it operationally practical? Can, is it going to fit with the existing infra, uh, internet infrastructure? I think increasingly it is going to, but some of the industrial systems are typical. And then this is a, a major issue we've found in the RFID space, in the area of what we call product intelligence, uh, where providers and consumers need to be comfortable about interchanging information. And there's a major bar barrier and a cultural issue around developing some acceptability of what, you know, what is exchangeable, what's not going to be exchangeable. Uh, but we are finding, just to finish, you know, we're finding uh, potential applications, uh, potential uses of these sort of ideas in really quite interesting areas. We're doing a lot of work now, we're talking with, with a lot of agricultural companies about how to actually use something you know, you, uh, Internet of Things in their highly, highly uh, variable, highly changing uh, environmental conditions, uh, where they're incredibly distributed as well. And so that, for us, is, a, is kind of a nice application zone. That we might hear more about that later. Okay, thank you.